Um, we have a presentation from Taylor Project from Hatchet and Seed. And um, Taylor grew up in Saskatchewan, um, was involved in agriculture there, um, did some work in for multiple years related to forestry and silviculture, both in Canada and the UK. Um, and since then has been working at building skills and applying skills into in organic horticulture, agroforestry and permaculture. So Taylor's been living on uh, Vancouver Island since 2010. And from 2014 to 2017, he ran a climate change adaptation project here in the capital region related to key lime water management. Um, and, and it included field research and education. He currently runs a company called Hatchet and Seed with his wife, Solara. And it's an edible and regenerative landscape design and installation company, which does many other things in Victoria, BC. So his presentation today is looking at how to apply key line management um, in the bulk new Chaco Fraser Fort George region. Um, but I know he's covering a few other things before that. So I'll actually just pass it over to Taylor now so he can properly introduce his, uh, his presentation and jump into it. Great, thank you very much, Samantha. Um, and thanks to Serena as well for hosting this. I'm just going to uh, share my screen here, if you can bear with me. This is my first webinar that I've ever hosted, so um, bear with me while we get my screen share going. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And again, yes, thanks to Serena and, and Samantha for uh, the introduction and for hosting this event. Uh, for me, it's a big honor to talk on this topic. It's something I think has pretty broad scale applicability in one way or another, uh, you know, as we look out at uh, some of the issues we face in agriculture, climate change, uh, kind of a, a big one, obviously, with, with this project. Um, and I think Samantha kind of summarized some of the key issues we're looking at in agriculture coming down the pipe related to variability with water and kind of more extremes. Um, in temperature and they all sort of lead to the idea that we need to, to manage our water if we're going to grow our, our own food. Uh, so I'll, I'll dive right into it. We're going to talk about key line water management. Um, I've kind of have a subtitle here, slow sink spread, store and plan for overflow. So that's kind of my three, four, five step plan um, that I think we need to think about on as far as uh, farm landscapes go. Um, so Samantha mentioned briefly, you know, I, I grew up on the prairies, but not in a farm family. I was surrounded by, you know, large canola and wheat fields, but I grew up in the suburbs um, and have sort of moved into organic horticulture and, and landscape design, ecological landscape design. Um, and so, you know, I'm not out milking cows every day or moving cows every day. Um, in fact, this is where I live um, here in Victoria on a tenth of an acre and so you know you might wonder um you know what what does this person <laughs> know about key line design and, and large-scale agriculture and the answer is you know really um a, a little bit but not that much i don't have 40 years experience in um sort of farming or, or key line design but uh, have worked in the last i would say uh, 10 years in this field with different farmers uh, as a consultant and with key line in particular I would say the last five or six years have been in that world studying with uh, with certain folks and taking workshops and then as Samantha mentioned um, this project here which is uh, was done from 2017 through to 2019 and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go um, but we were basically monitoring uh, key line plowing on treated versus untreated um, pastures. And so I'll talk about a little bit about what we found out during that uh, period. Um, what else can I tell you? So, yeah, you know, I would say even in my short sort of six to seven years in this field with key, thinking about key line, uh, I have more questions than answers, to be perfectly honest. There's a lot of nuance in this realm. Something that, that can be quite simple, it, it can get quite uh, 
quite complex quickly and there's a lot of nuance. There's people in different climates who are having certain uh, results. And then if you try the same thing in a different climate, you don't get the same results. Soil type, variability, all kinds of other soil best management practices. So there's a lot of nuance out there. There's a lot of um, kind of myth, I would say, or at, at the very least, um, a lot of kind of anecdotal evidence that's out there and then much less sort of scientifically monitored experience. So I'll do my best to kind of play between those two worlds because it's hard, it's hard to say no to a farmer who says I tried this and it worked. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's nice to, to back that up with some data. So we'll just kind of jump in here. Um, you know, one thing that we do, this is a, our newest project. I'll just mention um, kind of how we use Keyline in our world here in Victoria. This is our newest project, which is kind of an agroforestry um, orchard, which is all these rows. And they're all kind of based off of Keyline geometry, which we'll get into. And then a new market garden, a uh, small sort of market garden that we're uh, developing for our farm stand here in Victoria. So, you know, we are applying these things, but at, at different scales than maybe many of you out there. So I'll try to balance, uh, balance all that. Okay, so some books right off the bat. These are kind of what has shaped my perspective on Keyline. Um, this is all, this will all be available, obviously, through the recording, but uh, really good book here by Georgie Pavlov called Understanding the Application of Keyline Geometry. That gets into some of the details on just how you work this stuff out on your site. Another one, the Agrarian's Handbook uh, is excellent and uh, I've taken some trainings with Darren and he was a part of that initial project that Samantha talked about as well and offered some workshops through there. He's got a handbook that's currently online um, and the water chapter in particular deals with key line design. So that's a really good one. Um, kind of moving back through time, PA Yeomans, this is a classic water for every farm uh, out of Australia and I'll talk about PA a little bit as well but that was kind of the classic book he was the inventor of the key line design system and then a couple more recent uh, uh, books that have just come out so one is regenerative agriculture here by Richard Perkins and he's in Sweden a real cold climate and he's got a mix of market gardens and uh, grazing fields and, and nut silvo pastures and he's utilized uh, key line design extensively and writes about it in his book here and then lastly, a, a really good one for North American context is Mark Shepard's Water for Any Farm. Uh, and that just came out, published through Acres recently uh, in the last year. And he sort of deals with a lot of the North American landscapes that don't necessarily look quite like some of the Australian landscapes do. So just to kind of situate you, this is where I'm coming from is a mix of all of these uh, concepts. And as I said, there's really a lot of nuance in this. And believe it or not, there's controversy <laughs> as well, um, as there often is. So I'm going to try my best to sidestep a lot of that and just leave you with some real basic uh, concepts to work with and some ways in which it's being used uh, throughout, throughout the world. So um, this is a quote I really enjoy. Uh, we can stabilize uh, the climate and store carbon and restore watershed function as a byproduct of profitable ecological farming. So this is very much the uh, perspective that I come from. I, I think that we, um, we can do both of these things. We can sequester carbon, we can store more water on farms, we can have more canopy cover, um, more shade, more um, ecological function on, on farm. And I realize a lot of people might be coming to this from all kinds of different production models. Um, probably mostly, obviously, in this region, we're talking about grazing, ranching, and, and just forage production. Uh, but also maybe a little bit of grains and pulses, and potentially even some uh, agroforestry, silvopasture, uh, market gardening, potentially. And then even forestry and silviculture. I think that key line design has something to say about all of those different production models. And hopefully we'll be able to touch on uh, some of that as we go through. Um, so before we look at this map idea, I just wanted to say that, you know, I think no matter what your production model is, when we think about um, 
you know, ecological farming or, or resilient farming, how to have a farm that is as good now, um, or sorry, as good in the future as it is now or better. Um, I think we can all agree that soil health would be top of mind, as would on-farm carbon management and then water management. I think all those three things play together and, uh, and hopefully that's what I can leave you with. So I, I just hope that I can leave you with asking the right questions because as I said, I have more questions than answers, but hopefully this presentation can kind of give you uh, a wider range of questions to be asking about your farm. Um, okay, so watersheds. I mean, they've always interested me. These maps are, are great. Um, here we see the, the big uh, Mississippi River water, uh, system here. What's interesting on this map, of course, is we cut it off at the border, even though many of these watersheds extend up into Canada. This kind of classic uh, mapping where we, uh, you know, cut it off at the border. But um, yeah, I just think it is, watersheds have always fascinated me in the sense that they can be so long. You know, up here in southern Saskatchewan, uh, we have a little town that I'm quite close to called East End, where near where I was born. And that actually drains down into the Mississippi uh, River system all the way into the Gulf of Mexico. So we have a raindrop that falls up here in the, um, in the Cypress Hills, ends up all the way down in the Gulf of Mexico. So, you know, watersheds have always fascinated me and these maps just help with that. Um, so, okay, I think many of you are gonna be coming to this workshop with some sort of problem you're looking to solve and um, I've just summarized what I think some of those might be. So one might be declining uh, groundwater reserves for irrigation. So streams are drying up, especially where I am here on the uh, on the southern, you know, uh, southern island of Vancouver Island. Uh, but I know that's true of most of the, the province. We're seeing an increased need for irrigation and higher efficiency with the hotter uh, weather extremes. And also uh, much more variable moisture re regimes, so a lot less reliable rainfall and more excessive runoff, which is causing flash flooding. And all of this is exacerbated by the, these extreme rain events that climate change brings. Um, so that also results in ponding and pooling in undesirable places. Um, I say undesirable because sometimes ponding and pooling is fine if you're if you've got a plan for that and you want greener grass in in August it might be a pain in March when you're trying to get out there but ponding and pooling I think is something we need to actually come to terms with and just design for it and and kind of have sections of our farm that that can accept that uh, and then compacted and hydrophobic soils which is something that you know if you're doing a lot of synthetic fertilizers, you might end up with soils that aren't alive and they're not uh, living and breathing like they once were, and that's um, preventing a lot of water infiltration. So, you know, you may have some other ones, but those are, that's what came to mind. So when it comes to key line, there's um, kind of, these are my five things that I like to kind of um, share right off the bat. You know, if you take nothing else, key line is all about slowing, um, runoff water. So reducing the velocity of storm uh, runoff, reducing the erosion that that causes, protecting our rivers and streams from the dangerous swelling that can happen with these extreme events. So our farms are actually huge assets for our watersheds and they can accept a lot more water than many of them are and so I think that's a way that we can slow water as it moves through the watershed. Uh, spreading. So using gravity to move water from wet areas, the valleys, over to the dry areas and the ridges. And that's really the crux of Key Line, which we'll obviously be getting into here shortly. Um, sinking water, so that's another element. Increasing infiltration and percolation down into uh, the groundwater and increasing that interflow, which is the water moving sort of through the soil as opposed to on top. And uh, storing water is another big one. So whether it's a retention basin that is meant to just hold water during a, a, a storm surge, or even in a, in a pond meant for irrigation, um, we need to be storing more water on our farms with what's projected with climate change. And also uh, high organic matter soils. Organic matter is a huge, huge 
a friend of ours and it can store a lot of water on the farm and kind of delay the dry out period. So any way that we can increase our organic matter in our soils is, is welcome. And then lastly, planning for overflow. So um, I think it really all comes down to balancing retention and drainage. And, you know, I, I do believe that we over drain our agricultural landscapes on the larger, in the larger picture. We tend to plumb our landscapes and get the water off as quick as possible so we can get out there uh, as early as possible with our machinery to do what it, whatever it is we're doing. Um, I do think drainage is important. We have to consider it for sure, but I, I think that we need to get a better balance between drainage and retention. Um, but having said that, we definitely need drainage. We need to know where those record storm surges are going to go and we can't be surprised when we get those big rains because they're, they're happening. But my tip would be to try to employ drainage only when the system's at full capacity. So build your drainage for the big peak flows, but as much as possible, try to keep water out of it, out of those drainage systems. Okay, so um, I think I'll just yeah, jump into the history here a little bit. So P.A. Yeomans uh, invented the key line system and he's out of was out of Australia. He wrote a couple of books in the 50s, uh, The Australian Key Line Plan and The Challenge of Landscape, and then carried that on through the 60s and 70s. So he was a mining engineer who sort of understood a little bit about soil formation and he started chisel plowing his property on these pe very peculiar contour based uh, guidelines and was getting a certain amount of interesting results out of that. So he's really the pioneer of, of key line design. He, he coined the term and uh, yeah, he, he's been a real um, pioneer figure in this, in this realm. So his farm, you know, in Australia was quite droughty and dry. Um, and he was a big fan of these kind of flood irrigation systems. And I'll show a couple photos of his farms later, but he would, as a mining engineer, he was used to moving earth and he would, you know, try to look at how he could move the least amount of earth to, be, to build the biggest water storage as possible. And then gravity feed water out through the landscape um, and basically flood irrigate his, his field. So he was a rancher. Uh, much like many of you up in in the in northern BC, and he was reliant on a lot of this sort of uh, ditch irrigation, flood flow irrigation. So we'll just step back and look quickly at a couple components. Um, maybe Serena, can I just ask now that we're a few slides in, is everything okay? Can you hear me okay and see me all right before I get too far? Yeah, I can see and hear you great, and I haven't we haven't received any notes um, of anybody having challenges, so it sound, sounds good. Okay, great. So I will carry on. Um, so yeah, with as far as watershed basics go, you know, I think as farmers, um, land managers, we have to understand the watersheds we're in, and so a couple simple term terms here that we need to understand. Um, so rain falls obviously from the sky, and we see. Um, you know, certain depression storages in forests, we see a lot of pit and mound topography where a tree falls over and leaves a basin and that's a collection point. So we have these depression storages, we have ponds, farm ponds and dugouts. Um, so evaporation obviously is water um, sort of, you know, heated up and, and turned to, um, released into the air. Then we have infiltration and that's basically water um, entering the soil surface right on right at the surface. So rather than overland flow, which we see here, infiltration is getting water into that first few inches. And then percolation is a much deeper um, entry of water into the soil and into the subsoil. And then we get this term here called interflow, which is basically water moving along usually a constricted layer, a, a clay layer deep in the soil, um, but moving through the soil and that's generally filling up our streams. Uh, we hope that in most healthy watersheds it's interflow that's filling up the streams as opposed to overland flow. Nature doesn't generally uh, create conditions for much overland flow except in some extreme environments. So interflow is kind of the main way we want water entering the the streams. 
So another important component before we move into sort of the details is that when we think about water management, water moves nutrient and it moves silt as well. So we need to think about these, these things together. So when we think about water management, we're also thinking about how we're keeping um, nutrients on our property. So the first thing we need to understand regarding key line design is how to read contour lines. Many folks, whether you're um, you know, backpacking hikers or something like that, you, you'll know uh, how to read them. Basically, we get landforms like this. You can get maps from various sources. It's very important that we know the elevation, otherwise we don't know which one's up or down. But in this case, we have two different elevations. Now, an, an important component here, it's, it's very basic, but water moves at 90 degrees from contour. So what that means is we can draw very simple perpendicular lines. So um, 90 degree angles off of contour lines. And we start to get a general sense of the natural concentration of soil moisture across the landscape. And then we start to see where we're going to have generally more moist valleys running down in here. And we're going to have drier ridges out here. So these are shedding water in these different directions, kind of this way and here and there. And the valleys are the collector systems. So that's just a real basic sort of natural concentration of soil moisture. There's always a bit of variability, variability with that because subsoils don't always mirror exactly what's happening on the surface. So you can get clay seams and things where water will pop out in kind of unexpected areas. And other than sort of dealing with that on site, there's not much you can do uh, to plan for that. You just have to observe the, the landscape. So that's a lot of my approach is to be out on the landscape observing each site because there's so many exceptions that pop up to these things and they have to do with things that we can't always see. So um, it's good to understand the basics, but you also have to get out on site. So again, we have the natural concentration of moisture, um, having wetter valleys and drier ridges that are shedding the water. So hopefully that's clear. A quick quote here uh, from Ken Yeomans, who was P.A. Yeomans' son. And he, this is on, on pooling and drainage in the landscape. He says, it's important that the result of this pooling in the valleys is treated not as a problem of excess moisture to be drained away, but as a symptom of water probably being squandered from the upper slopes. And I think this really highlights um, the idea that when you're dealing with water, you got to start as high up in the landscape as possible. Um, so with bigger farms who have access to a, a real wide range of landscapes, you really want to start up high, um, infiltrating water and, and spreading it out across the landscape. So now we're going to look at what is kind of the classic landscape definitions that are used in key line design. And so this is from a uh, fellow named Georgi Pavlov. It's called Understanding the Application of Key Line Design, a publication of his. So what we're looking at here is kind of an idealized landscape where we have a main ridge running across the top here. Um, so this is the, the sort of macro landscape and that ridge is shedding water. And then we have these little valleys here and they're called, in the key line terminology, they're called primary valleys. So we have one here and one here. And that's where those, just like the previous slides, the contours are kind of facing each other. They're concentrating water into those areas and then down into the creeks. And a lot of landscapes, some we'll look at right in the Prince George area uh, through the GIS map, you'll find this uh, very often. So then you have your primary ridge, which is the center line here. So in this case, water's Water that lands over here is shedding down into this primary valley to enter the creek. And water that lands on this side is shedding over here to this side and down into the creek. So there are water divide lines in the, in the landscape and that's called the primary ridge. So something many of you have probably heard of if you've done any uh, preliminary work on, on trying to understand what key line is, is this thing called the key point. And that is the point in the landscape. It's always in a primary valley. And it's the point in the landscape where the contours basically, just before they start to flatten off. 
So we see right here, it's quite steep and then starting to level off. So this is called the key point. And you can often find that uh, in a landscape, it's, there's usually a seep there. It's a point of deposition. Usually there's a little more finer material. Clay will have deposited there. And so you start to get some moisture collection as opposed to the more erosive uh, nature that, that is above it here where it's steeper. Sometimes you'll find a willow tree there depending on the type of climate you're in. But it's this interesting point in the landscape where things start to sort of settle off and you get deposition instead of erosion. So that point, the, the key line in its classical term is the, is the contour line that follows the key point um, within the primary valley, but it only extends out to the edge where the ridge line starts. So we'll come back to this later. Um, we'll try to simplify it as much as possible. But the other thing to note here is that each primary valley will, will have a key point at a different elevation. You'll see here that in this key point here, it doesn't, that contour line here does not meet up. Um, there tends to be a descending relationship between the primary valleys as they follow this main ridge. So not all landscapes look like this, but it's a very valuable tool just to get a basic understanding. So I'll leave it at that unless there's questions at the end. Um, so now I'm going to show you one of our farms that we did uh, our key line plowing trials on back in 2017. This is on Salt Spring Island um, here in uh, southern Vancouver or southern Gulf Islands. And so what we're looking at here is there's a lake down here. Um, here is a primary valley running where my cursor is. And you can tell that this is classic. There's a willow tree right here, right? And this is where it starts to level off. So that is the key point of this primary valley, which drains into the lake. And then over here, we see these ridges, which run along this fence line. And you can even tell from this image, much wetter and kind of, uh, you know, there's some uh, willow trees and things like that in here. And then this ridge formation over here, much drier, um, not as green of grass. And so that's a very classic uh, landscape. And we see the same thing that extends over to this ridge line over here, and that's much drier than this valley here. So I hope everyone can see that. I'm gonna simplify it again. So this is without the um, image. And so again, just the basics of reading contours you're, you're finding that ridge line is running right down here. And then the valley line is running down here. So here we have two ridge lines, two valley lines. Um, so what I wanna show now is a, a real short video of key line plowing. I'll show you what you're looking at. The video I'm about to show you, I'm standing right where my cursor is, right in here. And we are key line plowing on the contour around this ridge. And it's a real trick because you, you would never guess that it's level. It looks like you're going uphill towards the top of this ridge. And you know, even watching this now, it's hard to believe. So hopefully this video works. We're plowing out of a valley um, around towards the, where the ridge starts. Hi folks, it's Taylor here for Hatching and Seed. Uh, I'm just shooting a really quick video for all the key line enthusiasts out there um, because we have a really classic uh, land shape here where we are coming out of a primary valley which runs down here and then you see the ridge line there now believe it or not it's always a mind trick but that purple flag is uh, a contour line so it's dead level going all the way over to the crest of the ridge and it's hard to stand over on that ridge and look back here and think that you're actually at the same elevation you feel like you're much higher but of course you're not so um Anyway, this is just the key line plow uh, following that guideline that we've set out. Okay, so yeah, this, this pink line, it even right now looks like it's going uphill and it follows around. You can't quite see it, but it goes around there. Looks like it's going uphill, but it's not. It's, it's dead level on contour. Um, I'll just go back to this. So, um, no, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Okay, so... We'll keep going. Some of the basic key line farm design strategies that we're going to be looking at 
is we're, we want to hold water as long as possible, as high as possible on the landscape so that we're reducing the pooling and ponding downhill during those storm surges. Another component is that you're looking to place roads on the ridges where possible. So how often have you seen a, a road or a trackway running right down a valley and it's just very mucky in the winter or the spring and you can't use it? So that's a, an element of design where, you know, pick your, your ridges for your roads. It's, it's fairly common sense, but it's amazing how often we, we don't see that. Uh, another one would be using roadway gutters. So if you're creating access on your farm or ranch, using gutters that maybe are before the roadway to strategically convey water to the drier areas. So using those contours to move water in a roadside gutter, uh, either to drier areas where they can just fan out and infiltrate on a spot that doesn't otherwise collect water or into a retention pond um, for use later. Another one would be to seek opportunities to spread water from valleys outwards towards those ridges. And we'll look at the, some of the ways we can do that. It can be through subsoiling with the rip lines or even potentially swales, depending on the context. Uh, we'll look at some of this terminology in a moment. Uh, and then developing as much economical water storage on the landscape as possible. So um, having access to, to water for irrigation, um, you know, where are the spots that you can move the least amount of dirt to create the largest amount of, uh, of water storage. And those tend to be in those key points, which we looked at earlier, which is why understanding uh, how to read a contour map can be very helpful. Um, also utilizing gravity feed water with cisterns or ponds as high in the landscape as possible. So, you know, up high in the landscape tends to not be great for, for natural ponds. You might not have the clay unless it is right at that key point. Any higher than that, you tend not to have enough clay to, or catchment to, to line it. But you can also put cisterns up on the hill. And then a lot of people will pump water from lowland ponds, which are, have a higher catchment and better, um, better lining capabilities with clay. And with a, just a simple solar pump, and you don't even need much for... Uh, pressure, you can just push that up the hill and then have a, a cistern up at the top that you can gravity feed back down. So that's a way that you can basically with with very little power, you can you can pump up without much pressure so that you can have stored pressure up the hill and then release that back down. So those are some of the different ways. And then also a lot of folks are, are really harmonizing their tree planting with the uh, key line water management infrastructure. So whether you have a uh, Maybe you have a, a conveyance ditch or swale that's moving water from a valley towards a, a ridge. Maybe you can combine that with some shelter belts that can keep some hot winds off your pasture, uh, maybe provide some forage for your animals, something like that. Okay, so we're gonna look at how you might start creating a key line layout on paper first. Um, a bunch of the resources I shared with you go through this step by step. Um, I would say sometimes the steps don't work for certain landscapes and that's what we've found and, and others as well. So you kind of have to play around with, with some different things. One thing I'll say right off the bat is in Australia, a lot of the landscapes that were initially adapted to key line, they're much older geologically and they've sort of done all of their um, smooth, they've been smoothing out for many, many more thousands of years. Whereas our more sort of geologically younger landscapes here in BC, they're still sorting themselves out. And so what I've found is, and others in North America have found, is that you'll find often a primary valley that has multiple key points. Um, and that can be confusing a little bit, um, but I would say just try to, try to strip it down, um, focus on, on what you're looking for from your, the function of your farm. So, Okay, here is how we are told to lay it out from uh, Darren Doherty's great book, uh, The Regarian's Handbook. So we're looking at two different key lines, just as we were in the image before. And let's say for this, for this particular instance, we're gonna key line plow, which um, is what I showed you in the video, subsoiling. We'll go more into detail on that later, but let's say we're trying to figure out how we're gonna uh, subsoil plow to get this the most benefit. So he's suggesting that first we mark out a guideline on our ridge here. That's the 
green line. So that's going to be where we start to mark out our lines on paper. And we're not dealing with the with the primary valley yet. We're just looking at this ridge. So we're starting at the bottom of the landscape on the ridge. And then we're cultivating parallel up from that. So you can see these lines are parallel to one another. And the contour lines are not parallel to one another. So we start to cross contour lines with our parallel subsoil rips. And the result of that is that we have water moving from the valley over here downhill towards the ridge. So in this case, let's say these are uh, they're 10 meter contours. So in this case, we have water falling 10 meters from here to here, even though this is much closer to that wet valley and this is right out on that dry bony ridge. So that's how you would start to lay this out on paper. And then you connect that to the key line in each primary valley. Once you get this pattern here, so now we have our single guideline here, which is right here. So it's mostly on contour, except for in the ridge, it starts to go downhill across the contour. So now if we play that out across the whole landscape, if you were to, if you were to just take your key line plow and start to plow along this dotted black line, if that was the first one you did, and that's called the guideline, then you turn your tractor around because tractor implements are parallel to one another, you would follow that and you, your, the geometry would, would follow this pattern. And the result of that geometry would be that excess water is shedding from the valleys downhill to the ridges. Because here's the creek and here's the ridge. So I hope that's clear. Normally I like to see nodding heads and make sure people are asking questions, but I'm, I'm hoping you can see that that we are moving water with this layout in rip lines from the valleys downhill to the ridges. Okay, now this is also from the Regrarian's Handbook and it is kind of an idealized farm um, that, that utilizes some agroforestry and some ranching techniques tied to, to key line. So here we have a primary valley running through the farm. And the first thing he's done is put in, in this case, a large irrigation pond right at the key point in here. And then from there, um, this is a, a gravity, or sorry, a solar pump all the way up to the top where there's a, a cistern up at the top. And then that can provide half a PSI per foot back down to, um, to the, the farm landscape. So we have you know, a main pond at the key point, pumping water up to a cistern. And then these green lines are tree rows. So in this case, it's an agroforestry scenario. And those tree rows are oriented such that they generally shed water towards these little mini ridges running through here. So that's kind of one example we'll look at, at some more. I'm going to run through this one more time very simply using a, just a different tool. This is uh, Georgie Pavlov's book. And so here we're looking at this simplified contour line and then running parallel off of that such that again we have generally speaking water moving downhill from the valleys to the ridges. So that is probably the most um, important realization that P.A. Yeomans found as he sort of played with this geometry across the landscape. So a quick note, this is from Georgie, you know, it's, it's necessary for compromises to be made. It, so we need to have layouts that are, it's better to have layouts that are not entirely correct, but that are easy and inspiring to work with than one that is technically correct, but that everyone hates working with. So just a quick note that we, ha we have to use common sense. We've got to strip this stuff down. Okay, so that's a bit about the geometry. Now we're going to move into what, what can you actually do with that geometry. And one of the first things that comes to mind is key line cultivation. So uh, let's, let's look at that. The idea behind key line cultivation is that you have this subsoiler and you have a particularly abused pasture like we see here in number one, very shallow rooting depth. And we run that 
key line plow uh, subsoiler. Two inches, this is the, the sort of prescription laid out in the book, two inches deeper than your current rooting depth. And then every year you do that again for three or four years until we get this component here. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the claim to fame is that you can develop topsoil by ripping into the hard subsoil, getting carbon down into that soil through the, uh, through the plants that are photosynthesizing and dumping off carbon, and that you can turn subsoil into topsoil. That's sort of the claim to fame. Um, in our trials that I'll talk about in a moment, that didn't happen in two years, um, but I, many people are sort of anecdotally claiming this, so I'll just throw that out that that's what, that's what we're aiming for with this type of practice. So this is a key line plow. So pretty straightforward. That was in our market garden that I mentioned earlier. Um, again, using, you know, going across the slope and it really does loosen up the subsoil. It's great for that. This is in a pasture situation, one of our trials. Uh, over here is kind of a bit messy. This is before we kind of fine-tuned the coulter which goes on the front and makes a cleaner cut. Uh, so, you know, if all's working well, it shouldn't be quite this, uh, that messy, but it, it can, it can pull up rocks. I got a photo of that. You know, you can rip up all kinds of things that are underground. So that's key line plowing. You know, we, we noticed as things were coming up uh, in the rip lines here, we have vetch and clover. We didn't seed that, it just that little bit of disturbance kind of opened that up. And I thought that, at least from a preliminary perspective, seemed encouraging. We have, you know, now nitrogen fixers that are going to go take advantage of that rip line. Um, so that's kind of some of the stuff we saw. Here's how we set a guide. Um, you know, as a tractor operator, you're not sure you want to you want to stay parallel to your last row. So we just put a simple metal bar on the end of the tractor. Um, so yeah, just talking about subsoiling in general, we as part of the project um, and many other key liners are big fans of this Yeoman's plow, which is a particular type of subsoiler. It's got these shanks, uh, or sorry, the shanks here that go down about 28 inches and then it's got these uh, grass cutting coulters that go out ahead and try to make a nice clean cut. Um, the Yeoman's Plow, you know, there's lots of subsoilers out there. Pan Buster makes one, Agro Plow makes one. Uh, you don't need a Yeoman subsoiler. What I will say is all the operators who used it loved this particular one. They thought it was very aerodynamic, uh, used less horsepower to, to operate. So we ran three shanks most of the time and we found it needed anywhere from 20 to 25 horsepower per shank. So if you're running three shanks, you need a 75 horsepower tractor. That very much depended on the weight of the tractor. A heavier tractor, could you could handle less horsepower uh, than, than a light one. So that, that's kind of what we were working with. One of the things that's really inspired me since, and I would love to see this developed, is uh, this super plow idea. So if you're going to burn diesel and run a subsoiler through your fields to try to move water in, in a certain way and break up compaction at the same time, uh, what else can we do with that diesel? So I'm a, you know, I think in terms of permaculture, which is all about multifunctionality, and this is a great idea um, that is in practice uh, in Australia. So uh, I think there's an image here. Yeah, this is at uh, Carversville Farm Foundation. So they have a, this is I believe a six shank key line plow with a drill seed on top and then a biofertilizer liquid fertilizer injector system. So, you know, you, you're marking out your contours, you're going across the landscape, you're subsoiling to relieve compaction, you're injecting fertilizer and you're drill seeding the edge of the rip line as you go all in one pass. And I think that's kind of, to me, I like the idea of multifunctionality. Um, subsoiling on its own, the results will be limited. There's no doubt about it. You have to incorporate other soil best management practices. So that, that's something that I'd love to see developed here in BC and, and tested and, um, you know, I think there's, there's potential application for something like that. I'm going to skip that one in the interest of time. Um, okay, so another 
tool that's available once we understand this basic geometry is swales. Um, there are contour swales, which are dead level across the landscape. So you would be following a single contour line, meaning it's level on one end as in the other end. And then there's also off contour swales, which are diversion swales, um, ditches, you know, at some point you hit a certain slope where water is going so fast that it becomes a ditch, I suppose. Um, a diversion swale, the idea would be that it's quite gradual, which I would recommend uh, rather than head it, you know, just sending water downhill as quick as possible. So these are some of the tools we have access to. Um, and just to give you a quick look at what that looks like. So you make an excavation, uh, you pile it on the downside, you establish vegetation there, water enters and you get this sort of plume of water happening and potentially some springs down below. So some potential advantages with swales would be, you can slow overland flow and nutrient with these structures. You can divert peak storm water to drier areas of the farm with a diversion ditch. So you can run at a say one to 200 slope over to those dry areas and have a bit of a just kind of fanned oak rain garden and just kind of spill, spill your water out on a ridge, which is a place that otherwise wouldn't get excess water. Um, the disturbance that is created by the swale is great for new plant establishment. So if you want to plant a windbreak or a shelter belt, that's a, a good way to do it. You get soil warming there, so um, that has advantages for especially annual vegetable growers. Um, and then you get a planting mound if you have a high water table, then you can get up out of that to grow maybe trees that you might not be able to grow elsewhere. And then you get more soil air interface, so better aerobic soil. Um, some of the challenges with swales are that you might have existing infrastructure and fences in the way. It's pretty common. You may get winters and spring, whoops, uh, springs in areas where you don't want them um, with, with swales. I would argue we need to learn to appreciate springs and, and use them, but uh, you know, if you're trying to seed a barley crop in in the early spring and your biggest challenge is wet soils, you know, you need to think critically about that. Um, you can get compaction of the swale bottom if you're using it as an access way and then at some point it can sort of stop um, infiltrating water the way you want it to. Swales with trees and other structures can block cold air drainage which drains downhill so you may want to um, have some breaks in that to, to allow cold air to drain. Uh, they can create access challenges for machinery and animals. So these are permanent structures, you know, if you're going to do it on a larger farm, say with animals, I would suggest that they be kind of gradual things that you could drive a tractor through when they're not full. So a drive through type swale. And lastly, I would say that they just fundamentally don't address soil health in between the swales. So if you're getting a lot of overland flow on a pasture like, like this photo, you might quickly say, well, I'm going to dig a swale to catch that. But a better question might be, why is there so much overland flow on my landscape? Do I have a plow pan? Was this all, you know, tilled and reseeded every three years such that we've created a, a hard pan? Um, and so that would be a better question to ask because before you go solve that problem, there might be other ways to solve the runoff problem and key line plowing might be one of those. Um, Okay, this is a, a great resource. Dakota Cohen is in Alberta um, and he's got a large scale farm um, ranch kind of set up and he's done a lot of bigger scale swale pond uh, development on his farm. And you can see the caption in this photo, it says, can swales infiltrate water in frozen soils? And this is a short video he did. I recommend you go find it. Um, the short answer is yes, it can. Uh, he's using a penetrometer here, which, which we did extensively in our trials. Um, and you'll watch in the video, he sort of moves across the landscape and everything else is frozen. But as he gets near the berm and the swale, he's able to puncture that and you can tell that water's getting down. So I think in a cold climate where you have, you know, spring runoff, frozen soil, I think key line is actually probably more important than where we did our trials here on the Southern Gulf Islands. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, 
quick note, just anecdotal evidence. One of the farmers in our trials, uh, who was not an official site that we monitored, uh, but he grew barley. He's grown barley for 14 years and he key line plowed a relatively flat field. I think the, the main issue here was compaction, uh, more so than sort of the geometry with which he, he plowed. Uh, but three years in a row, he reported the best barley crop he's ever seen. He dry farmed it, which he normally didn't do. And he anecdotally attributed it to just that key line plowing in the spring in this case, um, subsoiling, seeding right after so that those, you know, these are annuals. They very quickly take advantage of those rip lines and develop deep roots. And he was able to dry farm that. And he just, for three years in a row, he grew the best barley crop and he, he attributes it to that. So, of course, the way these things work, we didn't monitor his site. He kind of came on board after the project was all set up. Uh, but very interesting to note that, you know, even from a grain perspective, there's some application here. Uh, again, I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. Here we have uh, a farm in New, Th New South Wales, Australia. This is P.A. Yeoman's original farm landscape. So I showed some images earlier. Basically what we're looking at here, this would be a ridge pond up here. And then we have kind of a swale running all the way across here and down into this valley pond here. And you can see he's got um, infiltration swales or ditches running along here. And the wetting pattern we're looking at here is what happens when they release water from these ponds into these flood irrigation ditches. And so I think, you know, in the Prince George region um, or, you know, up there in the Buckley Nichaco region, I think this type of thing could make a lot of sense. Uh, flood type flood irrigation, storing water, storing spring runoff as high in the landscape as possible. Simple um, leveled engineered ditches that get water over to where you want it. Um, you know, now we have the advantage of, of, of drip irrigation pipe and other high density polyethylene pipes. So, you know, that we, there may be better options than flood flow irrigation. It, it does use a lot of water, but uh, regardless, this type of landscape, I think is something we need to move towards. He was famous for saying that uh, the farm landscape, the agricultural landscape should be 20% water when you look at it from an aerial perspective. So here's one of his farms here. So lots of ponds, <laughs> many of them connected with various uh, kind of swales or ditches. A couple ways you can get water out of your ponds. You can use a siphon. Um, I've set up two of these in my life and they're very simple um, to do. So you can just siphon right over top of a pond wall and you just need to have a, a valve up here you prime it, so you close this valve, fill it with water, and then quickly close that valve right when the whole pipe's full of water. And then you go and open this valve and it sucks the water out. So that's one way, and this can go down, you know, we had one go several hundred meters down into a, a lower pond. So that's one way you can get water out of a, an upper pond down to a, either a, a flood flow ditch or another small pond. Another way would be to put a pipe right through the dam wall. I won't spend much time on this. There's a lot of engineering involved. You need to make sure that you're compacting your materials correctly and putting an anti-seep collar. But that's what PA Omens was quite famous for, was installing a gate valve so that he could just open this gate valve and flood out. You know, there could be hundreds, 200 gallons per minute fl flying out of this pond uh, to, to feed the farm. So ponds are a big part of it and finding good places to, to put them and to connect them using some of this geometry to other parts of the farm. Um, okay, other places this has been uh, applied. Here is a, a layout in um, Wisconsin. I'm going to start to move a little quicker because I do want to get to a case study uh, using the local GIS map, but this is the agroforestry scenario in Wisconsin. So here we have a valley little pocket pond that catches the water that would head straight down that valley and it actually overflows out towards the ridge. So only when that whole system is full will it actually go back down into the uh, valley. So it's a, it's a surge protection system. Uh, this is Mark uh, Shepard, the same person we were looking at before, and this is what his sort of silvopasture looks like. So grazing animals through a, 
uh, this type of silvo pasture system. It's all laid out on that key line pattern. So again, just looking at that same farm, we have parallel rows, which is the real um, important part about key line. And uh, we have basically these swales are, are pulling water from the valleys towards the ridges. This is our little market garden. So same thing, kind of agroforestry scenario. And then we actually have been, you know, we key line plowed the pasture as well so in between those tree rows. So these are what these landscapes will start to look like. This is Mark Shepard doing drive through ponds. So these are little minor earthworks where you cast a little bit of extra material here and then you get these little flooded areas that you can still drive machinery through. Uh, snow fences, this is courtesy of Rob Avis, Verge Permaculture. He drove, he has a YouTube video, drove by a farm that put up silt fences. So you could put this across your key line to catch snow, um, you know, towards the, well, you can do it at the start of, of winter, but uh, so that you get this effect. And not only would you get these drifts, but you, you would have those drifts on, along that particular geometry. Now, one question that comes up a lot is how is a key line layout different from other layout patterns? And so I'm gonna quickly talk about, about that. And this is all out of the Regrarian's Handbook. And what we're looking at here, primary valley, primary ridge, the creek is here, so we're looking downhill. Um, what we're looking at, this is a key line layout. So if this was say tree rows or whether it was just the pattern of key line subsoiling, what we see is that we have parallel lines and we have that downward flow from valleys to the ridges. What this 96% here means is that if this was an orchard, let's say, or some sort of tree-based system, because it's equidistant, you're getting 96% of the stems per hectare as you would with a straight grid layout. So hopefully you're able to see that. I'm gonna to move to the grid layout now, which is here. So I know what, you know, the Buckley and Chaco region is not typically orchard country, but just to give the context here, most orchardists or any tree-based system are just going to run grid pattern based off the fence lines or whatever. And what this is showing is that while this is 100% of the stems per hectare, a grid, uh, key line layout gets you really close. It's 96%. So it has that advantage to it. And then you also get this potential redistribution of water. Now, lastly, if we compare that to a contour layout, which is what we're looking at here, Contour layout is where everything is on contour. And so you're following contour lines as they become irregular. And so you get these little stub rows and kind of these areas of where things come together and you kind of have to stop whatever you're doing. Um, and so here we're only getting 83% of the stems per hectare in an orchard or forestry setting. Um, the advantage to this is that this is a purely retention layout. So there's no real drainage from the valley to the ridge, it's purely retention. So I could see this maybe in a forestry setting on real sandy soils where you have no issue of extra water ever, you just want every, every inch of it. But uh, that's to differentiate it between key line. Key line is really distinctly equidistant rows. Um, that's a kind of one distinction that's, that's commonly missed. So it does differ from a contour layout. Okay, I'm going to do a little time check here. We have about 25 minutes and I do want to leave room for questions. So uh, I think I'm okay to, to finish up the last few slides. So surveying and practice. Um, we're going to start with contour maps if you have them. I'm going to pull up the Prince George regional map. We'll look at how to use that. But uh, you're going to want to try to get a contour map if you can. If not, I encourage you to get out there with an A-frame level like this simple um, A-frame with a, with a builder's level on it. You need to build it on a level cement floor so that it is level when it starts, but then you can go out and you can mark contour lines across the landscape. You can also use a, um, a laser level is quite easy. One person can mark contours. But I would say if you have a, a property that resembles any of these properties we've looked at with some varied topography and ridges and valleys, I would say just get out there with an A-frame level or a laser level and just start to mark out contours and just get a look at it. 
Um, if you don't live in a municipality that offers free GIS service, um, I, I'm sorry that <laughs> it's really too bad because many of us do, but I know many people don't. Um, you can fly a drone. There's companies that will come out. I've seen various ranges from $1,000 to uh, $2,500 to get detailed contour lines for a 100 to 300 acre farm. The economy of scale here is pretty big. I think you could probably get up to 5,000 acres for the same amount. Um, so bigger farms might might see an advantage to that. But there are there is now drone technology that can come out and do that. And there's other technology as well. But um, you know, for some of you, you might live in areas that have um, have GIS service. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and just quickly talk about what our field monitoring program down here on Vancouver Island was about and what uh, I think that might mean for other climates, in particular uh, the Buckley and the Chaco region where it's a real snow dominated landscape spring runoff. So we essentially um, took three farms, we divided them up like you can see in this photo where the ridge line is and we did a control and a treatment section. So we key line plowed the treatment side and we left the control side. And all of these farms were sort of um, underutilized. They weren't irrigated. They were just, uh, a couple of them were just uh, hayed or mowed. And we really wanted to reduce the variables to figure out does key line plowing alone make a difference? And then we went in and we put moisture probes in at 10 centimeters and 40 centimeters. And we, um, basically took a volumetric water content sample every hour, I think it was, or three hours for a two-year span and got a whole lot of data uh, with that. We also looked at compaction and rooting depth and, and active carbon and other things. Um, all the information there is on this website, crkeyline.ca. I'll make sure that's available. Um, but it, you just go on the website and click on it. Basically, we had a, a neurologist write a very detailed, thorough report. Mixed results, as you would expect with a small study like this. More research is needed. Um, I'm going to summarize very briefly a few things that I think are interesting. So again, this was just strictly key line plowing based on that geometry. And what we found was, among many other things, soil moisture content was measurably higher, 15 to 12 percent. Um, on the treatment then controls at the 10 centimeter depth on both farms between rain events during the dry season. So that's a mouthful, but basically that's encouraging. Um, it was holding more water on the treated side. So in the end that didn't turn out to affect forage growth because it was still so dry. We live in a Mediterranean climate here on the island. We weren't irrigating. And so that, you know, 15% of nothing isn't much or 15% of very little isn't much, but it was encouraging enough for me to think that if we had irrigated those fields, it might be a, a factor that could have um, increased that. So I thought that was interesting and, and potentially applicable to summer rainfall environments. Um, the other thing we found is key line plowing appears to increase the rate and volume of water infiltration into the topsoil during rainfall events of at least four millimeters over 12 hours, or sorry, 24 hours. Um, infiltration was not increased for lower volume rainfall. So another mouthful, what that means is here in Victoria, Southern Vancouver Island, especially during those three years that we did those trials, we had pretty severe drought. Um, and we had very, very few rainfalls that were over four millimeters, which is, is nothing. That's not a lot of rain. And so um, it was only during those rainfalls of more than five mils did we actually see the soil moisture probes kind of bump up on the side that was treated. And I think the reason for that is very simple, which is that any grass, forage crop, any crop really, um, the, the evapotranspiration rate in a single day is five millimeters for most of them. So that little bit of rain was immediately eaten up by the plants. It didn't even get a chance to affect soil moisture at all. Now, in an environment like Prince George, where you're going to get maybe a big summer storm, you might get a 50 mil August rainstorm. 
Um, and that might account for all of your rain that summer. I I've grew up on the prairies and I know what, you know, you get the averages, you might get 50 millimeters on average in August, but often that happens in one rain event and then you get drought. And I think in that case, this, this key line plowing, based on what we saw, would actually really help. It would get that water into the ground, reduce the runoff, and spread it around the farm. So there's potentially some application there. Um, what we didn't see, and this surprised me, was no sustained decrease in soil penetra penetration resistance in the rooting depth on the key line plowing versus the treatment. Um, I think the reason for that is that these sites we chose weren't as compacted as I initially thought. And one just quick tip I'll share on that is if you're doing compaction testing like we see in this photo, um, you want to do it when the soil is wet. Because especially the clays, they shrink and they swell. And when they dry out, they become rock hard whether they are sort of mechanically compacted or not. Um, and so you want to test them when they're um, wet because that's when you'll know if you actually have true compaction. So anyway, I will leave that there. It, I have one more, let's see. Well, this is on salt spring. So just a yeah, quick, when you're key line plowing, you know, if you haven't, if they're not worked fields, you're gonna be pulling up rocks um, often and you'll, you'll get this sort of thing happening. Now, just real quick comment on how this might translate to the climate in Northern BC. So here I'm looking at Prince George, I found some data, um, you know, on average rainfall in June and July, 65, 62 millimeters during that growing season. Um, I think that's fantastic. I mean, I wish we had that here in, in Victoria. We averaged 14 millimeters in July here in Victoria, where our trials were taking place. And that's the average in the last 30 years, what we were actually getting during those uh, three years that we um, ran trials was zero. We got literally no rain in July and uh, very little in August. So, um, you know, during where, where you actually have a summer rainfall environment, I think that having those soils opened up um, may have a, a, a bigger impact. Okay, so that's a lot of information. I hope it's landing. Um, I do want to quickly do a case study before I move into questions. Uh, regarding the Prince George Regional GIS map. So I'm going to pull that up here quickly. You can bear with me. While you do that, Taylor, I thought, think it might be pertinent to mention that when we were looking for the really detailed maps that you were needing for an example, uh, we were informed that most municipalities that have a river running through it does have this detailed mapping. So if you're looking for additional resources um, and to, just to see what's available in the region, um, contact uh, your local municipality or if you're in the regional district. Um, I found our regional district staff are also very, very happy to help try to help you access what information is out there. Awesome, yeah, appreciate that, Serena. Um, yeah, I found that most places, the raw LIDAR data, which is how a lot of this is collected, the raw data, is, it's mostly done for huge chunks of the country. Whether or not it's been input into a service like this depends on the municipality. So definitely push, here, here in um, Vancouver Island, we, had, we ran some workshops on the Gulf Islands who didn't have contours. We, with the CRD, we had them sort of push their local councillors and the CRD um, staff and enough people sort of demanded it that the next year they ended up providing it because like I say, the data was there, the, the, the LIDAR had been collected, they just needed to input it. And so, you know, the marginal cost of adding new regions is pretty small. So I, I hope that more people will demand this and I think it's very useful information to get your hands on. Um, so yeah, thanks for that. So what we're looking at here is the Prince George map. Um, I'll just go back to here. I have the link uh, in the slides. So princegeorge.ca slash maps. You just click on this, um, this image and that will bring up, bring you to this map. Now on the side here, you'll have to play around, but you'll see this arrow, you open that up and there's all the different layers. 
go down to the base map layer. Um, right now, I'm looking at imagery. You can toggle the imagery on and off. And you can even look back at different seasons, which is very Excuse interesting. Excuse me, Taylor, we're still just seeing your slide that says using regional GIS maps. So I don't, we're not seeing the. Um, oh, great. Okay. Describing. Let me get that one sec. How's that? Yes, now we can see what you're speaking about. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so I will just go back and show you what I just did. So you'll go to princegeorge.ca, this website, you'll click here, that'll open up this screen in your browser. And this is true, all of the different regional GIS services are very much like this. They have this um, layers thing over here. So you click on this, you can toggle when the images were taken. So you can go look back at historical um, imagery, which is very helpful to see where the dry spots were in certain um, times of year. And then you'll also see here the contours. That is not gonna be on by default. You're gonna be looking at this likely, and you're gonna need to go click on contours. So much like Google, you're just gonna be sort of zooming in and out um, you can also type in a property search. Um, what I did for this, you know, I, I've never been to this ranch that we're looking at. I have no idea what's going on there. I can, looks to me like it's mostly uh, hayed, potentially grazed a little bit, but I thought it would make a very interesting property to just very quickly look at. Um, and so I'm gonna zoom in here, just to one section of this landscape and see if we can put some of what I just talked about to use. So hopefully you can all see um, here what we have is this is a drainage ditch I can tell running down a primary valley and it looks like it goes along the side of the road goes under a culvert and then down through this valley. So hopefully you can see that. Um, then what I also see here is a primary ridge which starts right here. And if you follow my cursor, it's that sort of bony part of the landscape through here. And then what I see over here is the start of another small primary valley running through here. And you can kind of see a little bit of the wetting pattern that runs through. And then we have another ridge out here. So I'm gonna go back to my slides here. Hopefully you'll be able to see that. Now, can you see my slideshow? No, we are still on the PG map. Okay. There you, yeah, that looks like a slide. Okay, so, whoops. So now we're back. This is just an image screen share of this, the spot we were just looking at. So we could look at that whole farm, but what I find is you got roads, you got fences, you've got ditches, it's really best to kind of chunk off different areas. And so I'm just going to show you with my cursor, this is the drainage ditch, the dotted blue line running downhill following my cursor. And then we have a ridge line here. And then we have a, another blue valley line running down here. So we know that that's going to be wetter generally, this is going to be drier generally. And now what my purple is indicating is really roughly, I realize they're not perfectly perpendicular lines, but I just sort of very quickly chose a guideline. And I chose this spot right here just to see what would happen. And I went more or less um, just slightly downhill from this spot. So here I'm going downhill a meter from this spot here to right here. So I'm moving water potentially, or at least holding water on the ridge downhill from the valley to the ridge and then same thing back down to this valley. So it's that herringbone pattern that you're looking for and again knowing nothing about this farm um, what this information means would be you know if, if they happen to have compacted soils or excessive runoff I would probably walk out onto this landscape and if they had access to a, a subsoiler I would say, why don't we subsoil on this pattern 
so that we're both loosening the soil and potentially um, shedding that extra water towards the ridges. And so that's kind of a real rough layout of how you might use something in a typical sort of forage field. If you had the key line super plow that we talked about earlier, you might do the same thing and inject some fertilizer on the same pass. You might drill seed uh, some legumes or something like that. Um, but that's kind of at a very basic level what, how you might use it. We're going to flip to one other part of the same ranch. And yeah, again, we're looking at a couple different elements here. Here's a primary valley running through here that enters this big, small sort of forested ditch. We have another primary valley running through here back into that same sort of stream. And then we have these very small but not insignificant ridges that run here, those kind of knuckle sections and another one here. And so what I've just very quickly drawn up is you know, an idea of something you could do. I'm very aware that just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. Um, but in terms of water management, let's say we needed some extra irrigation water. This might be a good place up here in the primary valley um, in what looks like a key point in this valley to dig a storage pond. And then you could run that water, the overflow out along this contour line, it's actually going slightly downhill. And then you could dig another small, this is probably too big, but let's say just a small kind of more of a more of a rain garden, sort of an area for it to fan out onto that ridge. Um, so that you're, instead of water rushing down here and kind of flooding out the streams, we're actually moving water passively out here and letting it fan out in a much drier area. Those two ponds in this particular case, if we came over here, we could dig another irrigation pond and tuck it in there. And then you could have it kind of come out here and downhill towards this ridge. So same thing here, you could key line plow subsoil on that herringbone pattern, such that any extra water, especially your spring runoff when the ground's frozen, is actually shedding towards the drier sides before it enters your streams. So, you know, without knowing what's going on on this property and the cost benefit of what's going on, I hope that that gives some idea of how you could develop some integrated water systems in that scenario. Um, I am gonna stop there and open it up for questions. I'll just mention that I have some uh, resources up here. So when this becomes available, just some different GIS services, Soil Information Finder tool is a great resource that will tell you what kind of soil you have for most of the province. BC Irrigation Calculator is excellent. Um, it's got all the wells attached there. Same with the BC Well Log. So you can find the lithology of all the wells that have a well log in BC. It'll tell you, um, you know, how deep they went, how deep the clay was, the bedrock, all that. Um, so that's the well log. And then we, as part of the project we talked about earlier, we have a resource guide on our website. So this is kind of all linked in here um, and that'll be available after. Well, fantastic. Thank you, Taylor. So it, it looks like you've answered everybody's questions um, and we're just getting um, a lot of thank yous coming in. So um, I do want to thank you, Taylor, for taking the time um, to present all the information and sharing your knowledge and also for finding a way to do a case study from up north. I think that really does help uh, all of our producers up here to, to kind of visualize where to start looking at their own land. So I really appreciated that. Um, awesome. Well, thanks to you and Samantha for hosting and to everybody for spending an evening um, on what I think is a topic that has, you know, large applicability to, you know, all, all sorts of large scale landscape management, forestry, farming, ranching, all that. So I'm glad there's to see there's so much interest.